Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second event of the spring season at the Brennan Center for Justice. This event is titled Trumpocracy, David Frum in conversation with Trevor Morrison. I invite you at this time to please silence your cell phones. We don't want any ringers going off during the program. I also want to invite you at either of the tables behind you to pick up your spring lineup. We'd love for you to engage, to, we'd love for you to engage with us at Brennan Center on Twitter, Brennan Center on Facebook, or use the hashtag, hashtag BCJLive. We have two upcoming programs on March 6th and March 20th that we'd love for you to know about. Uh, in, uh, together with Carnegie Hall citywide celebration of the 1960s, voting rights then and now, and the Great Society. Uh, they celebrate the programs of the 1960s and how they continue to shape our lives to this day. We also invite you at the check-in center to sign up for our email newsletter and be informed of our upcoming events. After the program, Mr. Frum has generally, generously agreed to sign copies of his book. So if you would like to get an autographed copy, you can buy a copy at the sales table and then go to the signing table where Mr. Frum can sign your uh, copy. Uh, so with that, uh, in a couple of minutes, Mr. Frum and Mr. Morrison, Dean Morrison, will come out and the uh, program will begin. So again, please silence your phones and have a great evening. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Good evening, everybody, and welcome uh, to the Brennan Center of Justice event here at NYU Law School. Uh, my name is Faiza Patel. I'm the co-director of uh, the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center. The center, for those of you who don't know us, is dedicated to ensuring that our systems of democracy and justice work well for all Americans, especially the most vulnerable amongst us. You can check out all the great work we do online at brennancenter.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, all the major platforms, and <clears throat> learn about the various things that we work on. Our guest today is David Frum. Uh, he needs little introduction. His career as a political reporter and lawyer and his service in President Bush's White House is well known. I'm sure many of us here today have read his work in The Atlantic, where he serves as a senior editor. And David's latest book, Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic, is our topic today. Now, I, I don't think I'm saying anything exciting when I say we live in really tumultuous times. <laughs> um, you know, alongside the sort of daily chaos that envelops this White House, we've all seen the advancement of policies that are deeply disturbing and against everything that the Brennan Center stands for. Um, from a return to the bankrupt, tough on crime model of the war on drugs, to the Muslim ban and efforts to put uh, this country out of bounds for immigrants, especially those of color, Trump has pushed forward a retrograde agenda. But there's something more fundamental going on here as well, and that's what David se seeks to tackle in his work. You know, one of the things that the Brennan Center has been concerned about is that our democracy works not just on the basis of laws, but on the basis of norms and on the basis of institutions. Um, and norms and institutional integrity are a lot harder to ensure uh, than laws and policies are in a way, because you can take a law to court you can contest it, you can challenge it. You can't do the same uh, in forcing the, the president to release his tax returns. You know, it, It's not that easy to go to court and insist that he divest his businesses. Um, nor will courts you know, reprimand the president for attacking the press or for constantly asserting fictions as facts. So all of these things are going on that are really attacking the very core of our democratic institutions. And that's the topic of our discussion today. And joining David in conversation is Trevor Morrison, the Dean of NYU Law School, who I'm sure many of you know well. Um, Trevor is also a member of the board of the Brennan Center. And he brings to the discussion the sensibilities of both a constitutional scholar, but also someone who has a practical knowledge of actually having worked in the Obama White House. So I think we're gonna have a really rich, informed discussion today, and I invite you both, all of you, to join me in welcoming David Frum and Dean Trevor Morrison. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, and welcome to the law school. David, welcome. Glad you could be with us. Um, we've just been discussing the fact that our, among the things we hold in common is 
dual nationality, both having been born in Canada, but uh, also being citizens of the United States. Uh, we didn't get to talk about the implications of that for our rooting interest in the Olympics, and we might cover that later in the conversation. Uh, but let's start with the book. Um, it is an absorbing read. It's a provocative book. Uh, it's a bracing book in many ways. Um, what was your goal in writing it? Um, well, thank you. Trevor, thank you, thank you all. Thank you for coming out on this um, lovely f summer February day. <laughs> I understand there are a lot more of those in our future, so that's exciting. <laughs> um, a a after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a joke that was prevalent in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, how many Poles hung slash Hungarian slash Romanians does it take to screw in a light bulb? And the punchline was none, the market will do it. <laughs> and I think of that when I am told by people saying, don't worry, the institutions will save us. Hmm. Like the market, the institutions are made up of people and are driven by human action. So I, I wrote the book because I don't think that things happen automatically. The risk of the book, as I say at the beginning, is I'm writing early. Um, there's a lot of history yet to unfold, and I may have made many mistakes of, of fact and interpretation. But I wanted to mobilize people to rally to defenses of institutions that I see as endangered. Those that were listed in the introduction are some, but there are others too, uh, including um, the, the structure of American world leadership on which world peace has depended since the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. So we should talk about each of those. Um, the title is uh, um, Attention Getting. Trumpocracy, uh, that sounds like a new term of art. Uh, so what's its definition? Um, Trump, uh, Trumpocracy is a term that is designed to focus attention on a system of power rather than an individual. Um, like every journalist in Washington, I read the Michael Wolff book with fascination. <laughs> um, I, I learned a lot from it and I recommend it to people. But it, has, um, it, see, it, has, it risks misleading us in ways that actually are detrimental by focusing us on the um, personality of the president, and also on his gaps, his feeblenesses, um, in his gaps in information, his gaps in energy, all of which I'm sure exist, but he is a wilier survivor than he's given credit for, and around him there is a system of power that enables him. I think one of the things that, um, I don't have to tell a room full of, of students of law and supporters of the law, but the United States government is a big bureaucratic institution in a highly legalistic country. The president just can't just issue edicts and expect them to be followed. He works with others. And the thing I'm fascinated by are those others, the people behind the shoulders of the president. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that the book takes, well, the title might suggest that the book takes as its starting point the beginning of this administration. But in many ways, I think it's describing where we are in this administration as a symptom of some set of uh, developments over a much longer period of time. So and that this much, is less about Trump as cause, as Trump as effect, or as symptom. And so much fair? wider pe period of space. Mm -hmm. um, I, I won't burden in a talk a lot of statistics because they're, um, that they just, you, you use one and if you use two, it's like you used 100. But, <laughs> um, but here's one, if, if there's one you take away. I cite in the book the work of Yasha Monk, a German political scientist now at Harvard, um, he got a big grant to do a multi-country survey of, uh, before Donald Trump was elected president in which he asked the question, is it essential to you to live in a democracy? And among people born in the 1930s, about 80, 90 percent said yes across the developed world. Among people born since 1980, about 25 percent said yes across the developed world. And not just Americans, Canadians, Swedes, Germans, British. Um, so this is a more than American phenomenon. And there are Trumps everywhere. Geert Wilders, remember him? He's now the leader of the second largest party in the Dutch legislature. Uh, Marine Le Pen, who ran for president of France in 2017, she lost, but she got twice as much of the vote as her father did in 2002. There is now, for the first time since the war, um, a right nationalist party in the German federal parliament. Um, so these, and uh, parties, people like this, many Trumps are out in outright power in Hungary, Poland, and some of the smaller countries of southeastern Europe. We see democratic regression in uh, less advanced democracies, less consolidated, Turkey, the Philippines. Um, uh, the South Africa has just had a transition to power. We'll see whether they are able to get back on a better track than they've been in the recent past. But I think 
one of the things that Americans would also benefit from is when you have a problem that's bigger than America, you need a bigger than ex America explanation of why it's happening. Hmm. So let me just play devil's advocate for a moment. Um, some might argue, I'm sure that some would argue, that the diagnosis of this administration as being part of something that's fundamentally anti-democratic uh, needs at least further defense. Because on a first pass, it's populism. It's, uh, it's a form of democratic politics that expresses deep skepticism about established institutions because they've malfunctioned, because they've not served well, uh, a set of interests of the, of the electorate, of the polity, um, because perhaps they're thought to be corrupt or they're just preserving you know, elitist structures. Um, and that what the Trump administration is, is the result of a new kind of democratic politics, small d, um, that is not anti-democratic, it's a new majority expressing a new set of preferences. That's no. not how you would see it. I'm well, not first, saying it's how I would see it, but uh, what would you say to that? Well, first, it's very hard to be a new majority when you're quite a small minority. Um, <laughs> it, you, you are absolutely right. I mean, since, look, since the great surge of growth after World War II came to an end, um, there, there has, uh, people have been less deferential to experts dating back to the middle 1970s. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lively political tradition of campaigning on behalf of the people against entrenched elites. That's how, that's the, I'm, we're describing the Carter campaign sure. of 1976. Yeah. Those are Jimmy Carter's themes. And I mean, I didn't like Jimmy Carter much, but I would never have described him as a, a threat to democracy. Um, the, here's what's, what's different. And this is the thing that is uniting all of these different countries around mm -hmm. the world. Uh, we have the same crisis of confidence in elites that they did in the 1970s. We also have had a long period of very slow economic growth. We also have the baby boomers arriving at retirement age, the biggest, most politically powerful generation in history to date, about to make their biggest claims on the state in every developed country at a time when the state has less to go around. And the baby boomers are saying, protect us at the expense of everybody else. And all of this is happening at a time of radically, rapidly increasing ethnic diversity. The difference between Trump-style populism and Jimmy Carter-style populism is that Trump-style populism and Geert Wilder style and Marine Le Pen style and Nigel Farage style and wherever else is, they have this problem. Okay, you're the populist, so why aren't you popular? Why does a majority oppose you? And the answer that they all have to come up with is some version of, because those aren't the people we're talking about. That, that there are a lot of people living in our country, mm -hmm. but when we, see they, when we say the people, we don't mean those people. And it is, uh, and that's, maybe always there in democracy, but it has become, in recent years, because of the economic troubles plus diversity, increasingly explicit. And so a big part of the challenge to democracy that Trumpism, US, elsewhere poses, is that this is, as I see it, an approach to politics that is increasingly explicit, but eliminating from the political nation large numbers of people who live in the actual nation. But if that's true, is it also a problem that's self-correcting? That is, if we pay close attention to things like access to the vote, um, perhaps if the Supreme Court decides that partisan gerrymandering is something that it can deal with, et cetera, that the very fact that there isn't a stable Democratic majority in support of this administration um, on that understanding, or that you know Le Pen lost. Um, yeah. in, in other words, majoritarian politics is the cure for this problem as well. Well, I refer you back, uh, Counselor, I refer you back to my opening joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, that could be true, but it doesn't have to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what motivates me. Um, and let me put it this way, for a decade, it has not been true. And it has not been true in the United States, and it has not been true elsewhere. Because you know, when, when Trump was elected, um, there, there's a tremendous mood of excitement and dread in the country. And a lot of people would speak loosely with comparisons to the Democratic, I'm going to put this as, um, in as mealy-mouthed a way as possible because I so reject the analogy, but to the most notorious cases of Democratic breakdown in world history in the central part of Europe in the middle years of the century. And one of the things I wanted to, to uh, among the master ideas of the book, is to completely reject that analogy because you don't have to come up with the worst democratic breakdown ever to realize that democracy can corrode. Um, the analogy I keep using is that Trump isn't a heart attack of democracy, he is the gum disease of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> and 
you can, you can die from gum disease if it's left <laughs> untreated, but, but you have some time. And this book is a toothbrush. This, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I hope it's a hearty swig of Listerine. There we or, go. Or, okay, or, or the generic equivalent thereof. Sure. Which, uh, you can save a buck, a buck, buck a bottle. Um, so, um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, can, it, it, it may be self-correcting, but we have, to, uh, we have to act. And that is the reason to, to, to work now. Because un until now, um, what has been happening, unlike the democratic breakdown of the 1930s, which actually turned off democracy altogether, modern authoritarians have discovered they can be much more economical mm. with their use of applications of anti-democratic pressure. Mm -hmm. I mean, let me direct attention to the, case, the most extreme case in the fully developed world, Hungary, Viktor Orban's Hungary. So Viktor Orban is probably the most authoritarian leader in any advanced country. He has not wrongfully arrested a single person. There is no one in a Hungarian prison who hasn't been convicted in a court of law of something that everybody would consider a crime. And yet he's been able to destroy independent media, mm -hmm. to corrupt the courts, uh, to corrupt the central bank, uh, and uh, to enrich himself and his cronies and to um, redistribute money away from um, other people's cronies. And he has done all of this in a way that has become kind of self-reinforcing. And it's very hard to see how Hungary claws back. But he's done it without a coup. Um, and, and there are many people who could say, well, Hungary also has possibilities for self-correction, mm. except it just isn't self-correcting. So that raises an important point. And uh, Fais in the introduction talked about norms. And maybe we could talk about them there. Because what one would say about Hungary is that as you say, there's no clear illegality in these actions, but some of them at least have placed major tension on some received norms as to how government was supposed to be conducted. Yeah. Um, things that are more sort of soft law, not hard law. Um, what concerns you most? And there's a lot of discussion these days um, that the Trump administration is putting pressure on norms, and some of that I'm sure the administration would agree with. Its, its goal is to upend some traditional ways of doing things. What are the norms, though, that have been threatened or that are in danger of being threatened that you're most worried about? Well, let me start with the most spectacular and then move to the most important. Uh, the most spectacular is this. Um, the, the theory of the case is that the president appoints the director of the FBI, the Senate confirms the director of the FBI, and the president can then remove the director of the FBI. That's the theory. Mm -hmm. The practice is, until now, the president cannot remove the director of the FBI. That when um, Bill Clinton, the last time a, a director of the FBI was removed, as I think everyone here knows, there was an elaborate consultative process um, where uh, the person in question was accused, maybe it turns out in retrospect, maybe unfairly, of not using expense accounts properly. Mm -hmm. um, this became a huge argument inside the Clinton administration. The president was convinced it was true. There was, no, there was notice to the director. Uh, the director was allowed to have his case heard. Uh, it was taken to the relevant people in Congress. Again, there was no formal law, but there was a kind of consultative process. The whole process took weeks. And at the end of it, the president <coughs> confronted the director of the FBI and said, you know, not only I, but the heads of the House and Senate Judiciary Committees think you haven't used your expenses properly, you're fired. Um, and that set a norm that the, the president can't just fire the president the director the director of the FBI at will for mm. any reason. Mm -hmm. the, the new post-1993 rule, which is sort of what you'd like to see with the head of your state, your federal police organization, is the, F, the FBI has to be fired for cause after getting a lot of buy-in from a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. um, Donald Trump has just tried to set a new rule. The president can fire the FBI, head of the FBI, for any reason, including investigating the president and his friends. Um, and what is... And one of America's most important newspapers, the Wall Street Journal, will publish articles from learned people with chairs at the Hoover Institution who will defend that principle. And if this succeeds, that will, that will be the new principle of law. Whoever's the president can fire the director of the FBI for any reason. And many of these people argue that he, the president can tell the head of the FBI what cases to investigate mm. and what cases not to investigate. Mm. And that will be new. The thing I most, so that's the most urgent. Here's the most immediate. I think one of the ways, and again, center name for Justice, Justice Brennan understands this. Um, you know, the United States has typically been one of the less honest of the major developed countries. <laughs> um, standards of integ public integrity have been lower here than in Britain, Canada, Australia, Scandinavia, and you know, Germany. I mean, but they're not murdering people. Um, do, uh, do, do you mean uh, honesty and 
public discourse generally or literally in what the government says? Or? I mean, bri you want a new road to your factory, do you bribe somebody or not? Okay. And uh, America has a long healthy tradition of, especially at the state and local level, of political corruption and dishonest politicians, politicians who do not live only on their salaries. And that's probably been more true here than in for most of the time. But um, beginning in the progressive era, and then rapidly after the 1970s, there's been a major cleanup of American politics. So yeah. we've had a period of, uh, this has not been true since time immemorial, right. but rising standards of ethics. So Lyndon Johnson, while he was president, was, he owned radio and TV stations, and he, would, and he was a CBS franchisee, and he would meet with the executives of CBS at the White House and renegotiate his deal with CBS. And did he get a better deal? He did get a better deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so after Water, a lot of this was secret. Um, uh, at the time, it all came out during the Watergate hearings because one of the lines of defense that pro-Nixon people had is, what are you talking about? Johnson did it, Kennedy did it, Eisen, uh, sorry, not Eisenhower, but uh, and Roosevelt did it. And the Nixon people were right. They're, his predecessors had done all of these things. Um, and so the society, okay, we're passing a bunch of new rules and establishing a bunch of new norms. Mm. Uh, the president can't run a business. No one ever put that into law. It's impossible to put into law. Mm. Also, we put into a norm, and by the way, the president's immediate relatives shouldn't run businesses. Be trading on the, uh, that, 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 and no, you, how do you write that down? What's an immediate relative? Um, but that also became understood. The president's relatives had to keep their noses clean. And so we had a period of increased public integrity. Um, now that's come under some pressure in very recent years, but Donald Trump has ripped all of that up. And we are now back to standards of public integrity. We have never seen this. I mean, no president has run a business enterprise of this scale from the White House. Er, er, Lyndon Johnson is like a couple of TV stations, and nobody before Johnson had ever done anything like it. Meanwhile, the role of the family, and this is like something out of Kazakhstan, um, it's completely un-American. Um, but not if, clearly illegal, which is the problem. It's, it's absolutely. Contrary to norm. It's absolutely yeah. not illegal. It's, yeah. it's clearly legal. Um, by the way, it's not clear that it's illegal for a candidate for president if he can avoid technical violations of the elections law. It's not clear that it's illegal for him to work with a hostile foreign intelligence agency to do damage to his opponent. Um, they're, That's they're, trickier in terms of how well, he does it. Well, it's yeah. hard to imagine how you do it without tripping over some right. technical statutes, right. elections law and foreign agents registration. Exactly. But I, I can, with, I, we can talk about this later, I can give you scenarios where you can do it without tripping those things, mm -hmm. and it's just shocking, but it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. So whether it's uh, viewing the president's relationship to the director of the FBI you know, in a sort of conventional at-will employment way as opposed to respecting the norm around honoring the, uh, the term of years that the director's been appointed to in absence of really strong cause or whether it's uh, uh, not separating from business interests upon entering the White House and really the person of the president and his family continuing to run a business in ways that seems clearly to be leveraging the position in the government uh, to the benefit of the business. Uh, to the extent that those norms have been not just threatened, but have been ripped apart, how do those or any other norms get rebuilt? The, the thing about the, one, the way one would describe norms is that they, don't, they aren't invented overnight. They're mm -hmm. the result of a kind of accumulation of practice and wisdom. There's reflected some sort of institutional settlement or institutional equilibrium the political scientists will talk about. So that, those equilibria have been uh, upended. Yeah. Um, supposing there were sufficient uh, people in positions of power and influence and voters uh, interested in restoring those norms, how does it happen? Well, this is where I, my maybe instinctive pessimism kicks in, that one of the things that, that, that is part of the tone of anger of the book is that these norms, I mean, if you know American history and American law, they were really hard to build, and they have been very imperfect. Mm -hmm. They've been better at the at, for the president than for Congress, better at the federal level than at the state level, better at the state level than at the local level, but mm -hmm. always very imperfect. But they can be smashed re really easily. And once smashed, um, hard to put them back together. If, if you've got a society where policemen are in the habit of taking gratuities, it's really hard to clean that up. Mm -hmm. And you can be a very advanced country. You can be Italy. Mm -hmm. um, and you still, it's, it's hard to do. 
Um, uh, on the other hand, um, so don't initiate it because it, the, the road back is, is not so clear. Um, you know, one of the, the questions that will be true for whoever is present in the future, I mean, I, I can imagine, for example, that if there's a revulsion against Donald Trump, if, if he does badly politically and the Republican Party does badly politically, I, I can imagine that some future Congress will pass a law that the president must declare his mm -hmm. tax returns. That is no longer voluntary. That's very easy for me to imagine. Do I, how do we write the law that the president's family cannot trade on his position? I don't know, I, I don't know how you write that law. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons that, the, that in Hungary, the far right party, Jobbik, the, the, the neo-fascists, mm -hmm. one of the reasons for their success is they voluntarily publish disclosure forms, not only for the members of parliament, but for their wives, children, and parents. <laughs> And that, that they send a message of, you know, uh, because they know that in the Orban party, the Orban, you know, Orban puts all his assets into other, the hands of his immediate relatives. How do you, and, and there are, you know, we hope, we hope there are honorable public servants, but the typical public servant, he looks at the Trump family. If this works, <laughs> why wouldn't you do it? Hmm. So if there's um, an opportunity for restoration of norms, and I think you're right that um, certainly American history and law suggests that moments of extravagant new exercises of executive power are often responded to at some later moment with legislation. So some of these shattered norms may well return, tax returns for example, in the form of, in the form of legislation, which is its own question about whether the well, best way to impose a norm like that is through a law. Well that's really, so one of the, the chapter of the book that um, has gotten the least attention uh, and that I, I, I now spend a lot of time talking about this, I think it's, it, it makes a point that we don't talk about enough, is, is a chapter called Autoimmune Disorders. Mm -hmm. the, the, the system responds in yeah. self-defense in ways that are very dangerous. I mean, we will pass laws, but one of the things to be aware of when we pass laws, this is a highly legalistic country, and Americans tend to think, if it's not illegal, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so every time you pass a law, yes, you prohibit certain activities, but you, in effect, give a blessing to others. And that is going to be, one of the things I really dread is the coming debate over collusion. Mm -hmm. Because a, as the facts come into view, hypothetically, if it turns out that lower level people did things that broke laws, but higher level people did things that did not break laws, but are just shocking, um, that we are going to end up in effect, legitimating the things, it's going to be very hard to persuade people um, that a non-illegal form of cooperation with Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that a lot of people are going to have a, st a strong stake in believing, well, they'll, they'll begin by saying, I don't like it, but it's not a crime, and they'll end by saying, well, it's fine. Yeah. And, and you can see, if you watch the Hannity program, you can see that process is already two-thirds of the way to completion. Um, if you start passing these laws um, in the future, it, that what you're going to end up doing is ex laws extinguish norms mm -hmm. because they create an implicit permission for the thing on the other side of the legal line. I think that's an incredibly important point. That seems to be what's happening in the, as you say, as articles, et cetera, are published, defending the notion that the president has the authority to terminate the director of the FBI effectively whenever he wants. Yeah. That's true as a technical legal matter, and the form of that argument just takes the air out of the room for a discussion of things that might be lawful, but not good, right. bad but ideas. When President Obama um, presided at the ceremony where he welcomed his first crop of U.S. attorneys, mm -hmm. uh, he famously said to them, I appointed you, but you do not work for me. Um, and that's the attitude that we sort of expect. James Comey, I think, made the point that he had, he had had, if I remember this right, one face-to-face -face conversation with George W. Bush and one face-to-face -face conversation with Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the, the pre actually it turns out it's very rare that the president and the FBI director ever talk one-on-one. -on -one. And has been rare ever since the J. Edgar Hoover days for reasons that have to do with, everyone remembers what the president What they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that to happen yeah. anymore. Yeah, and certainly the thing, if they were talking, the last thing you'd expect them to be talking about is a pending case, a pending right. investigation of some kind. Right. Again, a norm, not a law. So. We might think about different actors that could be involved in helping us restore norms if it's possible to do. Um, and one set of actors are uh, the other members of the party that the president has declared himself to be a member of. Um, where does the Republican Party show up in this? Um, 
I, I think that there has been some invisible gravity from members of the party on Trump. That is why there hasn't been a firing yet of the special counsel. Um, I, I think it Or maybe of the attorney general as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, right, I think you're probably right about that. There's, I think there, there's some communication, like, you know, if only because it would make their lives, at least at that moment, difficult. Now, I don't know that that will continue to be true, and the fact that people do it invisibly rather than visibly mm -hmm. is itself disconcerting. Mm -hmm. um, but the relationship between, uh, I mean, in some ways, um, it's a kind of Stockholm system uh, syndrome, and literally so. In that the, the Republican Party began as a hostage, a kidnapped vic victim. Trump forced himself upon the Republican Party. He was not, um, about a third of the primary electorate really liked him, and two thirds did not, but enough of them yielded to make him the nominee. The party, the donors were very reluctant. I talk in the book about the flow of money to Donald Trump. He does, even after he won the nomination, he did not do very well in tapping the deep pockets. He only began to get large amounts of money from the major donors after he outright won the election. And then the money flowed to his inaugural fund, which is one of the most mysterious sources of money at a president's <laughs> disposal. Yeah. Um, but he's bent them to his will, and they are now entrapped. That what he's offered them, not, this, I, not as, I don't want to say, not as in a conscious way, but this is the offer that has grown up, is because he is so amazingly indifferent to policy. And because he is ignorant of a lot of the main traditional rules of politics, he's been willing to sign legislation yeah. that any normal self-preserving first-term Republican president <laughs> would not sign. Uh, I mean, the, this tax bill, it, it would, maybe pre a President, Ryan, President Ryan would sign it, because he's a believer. But, <laughs> but, but, but um, a President Rubio would say, I don't know. You've got to give me something here for people in the middle, and we can't hit New York and California quite like this. We're going to write, wipe out you know, our House delegations. You have to give me a little something here. Mm -hmm. um, Trump signed it without probably understanding very much. In return for this, he signed amazing things. And he will sign the repeal of Dodd-Frank if they send it to him. Again, a lot of things that a normal, self-preserving first-term president would be ca cautious of. So he, it's, it's he apparently will sign things on the other side that a Republican president wouldn't sign either, or at least many would not, like announcing that he's open to a path for citizenship for people who are undocumented, right? Well, he said the, 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 great, thing, the great thing when you will say anything without <laughs> remembering it or being held to that, he can, uh, he'll, he'll say anything. Right. It might or might not be true that yeah. he would sign yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. He'll make noises yeah. about things. But, <laughs> but what he offered, but, but, well, then he has a demand in return. In return for signing your unpopular bills, you have to give me impunity. Yeah. And that, the, that one of the autoimmune disorders um, is the destruction of congressional oversight of intelligence. What has happened to the House Intelligence Committee is really serious. I think it has been, and the United States creates intelligence services during World War II, they're normalized during the Cold War. For 35 years, they didn't tell Congress anything about what they were up to. And they told the president not very much about what they were up to. So in the scandals in the middle 1970s, new rules were put in place where they, they have to tell the president more, and they have to tell the Congress something. But their cooperation with Congress is highly voluntary, um, and it's always a, a struggle. But these two, so the, the, the Congress responded, they created the Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Intelligence Committee, and they were supposed, they, until now, operated at a higher standard than other committees. They were much more closed mouthed they didn't leak, they had a really good record of, even the House Committee had a good record of not leaking. The people who were appointed to the people were not just your typical, it was an honor, um, and there was enough trust that some things were shared. Yeah. So when you have a complete partisan clown um, uh, using his position on the committee to attack the integrity of the FBI, which is an intelligence agency, you have to, what is gonna happen to the flow of information to those committees? I mean, I think it's going to slow. And, uh, and so today, you think, yeah, it was probably just as well not to tell Devin Nunes any important secrets. Um, <laughs> but he won't always be there. Yeah, and his some, successor will be his there. His successor will be we'll there, be, and they'll yeah. be saying, well, you know, you know, you could turn into Devin Nunes too, so it's better that you not know. And I, I ask a question to consider. I mean, how informative do you think the President's daily intelligence brief is right now? <laughs> uh, you know, that, that he blurts, so you're the CIA or whoever puts this thing together. You know the president blurts secrets, not only to the Russians, but he told the president of the Philippines where America's nuclear submarines were on the day he happened to talk to him, <laughs> which is really useful. If you're planning a nuclear decapitation strike against the United States, that's, you want to know that. And he told that, blurted that to Duterte to show off. Um, he shares it with a reported 14 people 
Obama and Bush would have shared it with maybe four or five, including the chief of staff, the national, national security, security advisor, advisor um, right. one or two other supremely um, uh, high officials, mm -hmm. 14 people, one of them being a person without a permanent security clearance, the president's son-in-law, uh, who has complicated ties, to, uh, financial ties to Russia, China, and Qatar. I mean, if you're the head of the CIA, well, if the president asks, we won't refuse to tell him, obviously. But if he doesn't ask, <laughs> I just fill it with pictures. <laughs> um, and, and that is a habit that is highly congenial uh, mm -hmm. to the CIA because they, they don't trust people outside the agency. They don't trust people in the FBI. They don't trust people in the Pentagon. Um, they've never really loved the White House. So any attempt to try and reform this, though, by uh, people sitting in elected office now um, that doesn't have some serious buy-in on the Republican side, though, is just going to you know, be coded as partisanship. Right. Any, any attempt to deal with this, and the same way, what, whatever one makes of Nunes and Schiff, I think the country is seeing that as a partisan fight between right. two. And so how do we get past that? You talk in the book, you call for a new politics of commonality. Yeah. Um, and I was struck by your referring to yourself earlier as a pessimist, because that doesn't sound pessimistic. That sounds really optimistic. Um, and I want you to convince us why it's realistic optimism. Well, okay, so I, I, mean, I don't, I, I'm not here with a four point plan of things <laughs> that can be implemented that will make all of this better. And I don't think it's going to be easy. Uh, this, uh, um, so I am in the camp, one of the, as I said earlier, there's this big debate in Washington about, you know, um, are we going to be able to shake this off pretty easily? The yeah. case, and I, I don't believe that. Um, and the, the calling for this kind of politics comment, this is, it's a big ask. And I, and I say, it depends on people. Uh, that's one of the reasons I um, do this Johnny Appleseed tour, touring around the country um, that I'm doing. It, uh, the existing party system can't cope with this. Um, that if we get through this, what we're going to have on the other side is a party system that looks very different from the party system that we've recently had. Now, that's mm -hmm. not impossible. I, one of the things I, you know, we're living longer and longer, thank goodness. Um, but what that means is that we carry the past with us for longer periods of time. So imagine you're, stand, you're a time traveler standing in the year 1990, and you jump 25 years ahead. Who are the two most important politicians in the country? To 25 years ahead to 2015. Who are the two most important politicians in the country? Bush and Clinton. Um, you know, who's the most difficult person to deal with in Washington? Newt Gingrich. Uh, what, you know, what are the issues? Healthcare in Iraq. I mean, nothing changes. <laughs> now imagine that time traveler tra going back 25 years from 1990 to 1965. The most powerful man in Washington is the head of the AFL-CIO. Um, it's a, di there are liberal Republicans. It is a different world. They're just passing the Voting Rights Act. It's a different world. So, and the party system is completely different. The way we get out of this is today's Republican Party has, faces this problem. Um, it is passionately, intensely, sincerely committed to an agenda that cannot pass democratic muster. And its way out of that dilemma is to de-democratize the American political system. Um, the, the change will come when conservative-minded people, some of them Republicans, some of them not, say, what we need is a party of the center right, a party of enterprise, a party of private property, a party of the haves. That's what it, that's what drives it. A party of you know the people's grandparents who live in the, more in the country that is com that wants a program that can't that is accepted. Turning off the symbols of the methods of democracy is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So you have to come up with your program, your conservative program, in ways that can pass democratic muster, and that's the only kind of democrat. That's the only kind of program you can have, um, and. That is by a circuitous route, but that is a very different party system. Now, I, I believe it can happen because the party systems have changed radically within the lifetimes of people in this room. Um, and the present Republican Party wasn't there forever either. It wasn't there in 1985 or 1975 or 65, but it's been there, it's been growing up since 1990 and especially since 1995 and especially since the Great Recession. And it's now a real fact. And so long as you have it there in this present form, um, this is the path we're going to tread. For the audience listening in the future to the podcast of this, I'm going to remind everyone that this is NYU Law School's Brennan Center for Justice program, and we're talking to David Frum, senior editor 
at The Atlantic and author of the new book, Trumpocracy. Um, let's come back to uh, just where we were on the party system. Um, some on this faculty who study uh, law and politics have made a similar uh, call, I think. What they've said is part of the problem with, with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party uh, is that they are too susceptible of control by the people. Um, and that what both of those parties need is some smoke-filled rooms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is some people to uh, assert greater control over the direction of the party yeah. uh, so that it can move in wiser directions. Is that what you're saying? Um, look, I'm, the, the, that's a, if you don't remember the original smoke-filled rooms, it's yeah. a very attractive idea, but here's Indeed. the problem. The reason the original smoke-filled rooms worked um, was the people in the smoke-filled rooms were people who didn't believe in it, who thought the purpose of politics was filling postmaster jobs across the <laughs> right, country. Right. Um, they, they were patronage parties. Yeah. And th those kinds of parties, they reject, they, they disliked ideas and idealists because they were distractions from the important job of winning elections by saying as little as possible as right. it took. So you go to the and real business yeah. of distributing patronage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're not going, we have a, we're not going to unpass civil service reform, nor, <laughs> nor of course do we want to. Right. Um, so, so you're not going to have brokerage patronage parties in the 21st century. And that means that the, peop if the people in those smoke-filled rooms are going to be about, the s they're going to be concerned with the things that are the stuff of politics today, mm -hmm. and those are big concepts. Um, so how do you imagine this kind of partisan change um, coming? Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's not just by political tinkering. Uh, the, the, th the, the kind of changes, the way we'll get onto political stability, if we see, if we one day wake up and realize the rapids are behind us, um, uh, these are the things that will have happened. One is the pace of economic growth will have picked up. So there's, there's more to go around. Um, the second is, I, I'm, I don't know a tactful way to put this, so I'm just gonna put the untactful way. The baby boomers will be a lot older. <laughs> and there may be, <laughs> and there may perhaps be fewer of them. <laughs> and, and, and the reason that that point about the baby boomers being older is important is this. Right now the baby boomers are in their 60s. That means, um, they still have a lot of private savings. That means they still think of themselves as people who are paying in as well as receiving from the state, and that means there are approximately equal numbers of men and women. Mm -hmm. 12 years from now, um, the baby boomer generation will be much more female. It will have mostly exhausted its private savings, and it will be much more dependent on the state. And its politics will look very different, and they will also be weaker relative to everybody else. They will not be able to say, throw all the other luggage of the state overboard in order to save our, our Medicare, our Social Security. Um, so I think the, the, the fading of the baby boom generation will make a difference. Um, I think a, an abatement in the rate of immigration and demographic change um, will be really important because um, mass immigration is a, the proximate cause of destabilization in all of the democracies. And then I think... Um, Isn't it also a source of energy in a lot of democracies? It's a, the, the pro, it's a source of economic energy and political instability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the problem with it, of course, is um, as your native birth rate declines, as your economy, the, exactly the, this is the, tra the tragic paradox, the economies that need immigration most are the societies that can cope with it least. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I think of this as a case where you have to put social stability as your top interest. And then one, one other thing that I think uh, when we look at it behind us is um, uh, the attempt to shrink the electorate will have failed. Um, and, if, uh, and if that has happened, then the party of the haves, the party of the center right will say, we have no choice but to look more like the Australian liberals, the Canadian conservatives, the British conservatives, the German Christian Democrats, and accept a social, you know, be a right of center party within a consensus about a social insurance state. So this is really, I think, if I understand, it's an argument that the only um, realistic version of a conservative-leaning party that could be successful is one that has to come back from the brink on these points, but one, one that has to um, establish a workable relationship with a larger electorate. Right, um, and people are not gonna reason their way to that outcome. Right, they I need mean, to I, experience I mean, been, some failures. I, 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 I've been, uh, I, I'm now raising my third teenager. Um, so I'm going to repeat a lecture. I repeat to Republicans a lecture that I repeated to my children um, without success. And I, <laughs> that it, it's, it's good to learn from experience, but it's better to learn from other people's experience. <laughs> 
But some, but you know, if you've had teenagers, sometimes people insist on learning things the hard way. And, and so I've been saying to Republicans for, gosh, since like the middle of, of the last decade, you know, I can see this, don't be like this. It's, going to, it's probably going nowhere good. But I think they will arrive at it not by thinking their way through it, but through pain, through electoral pain. In some ways, I think the, what the book lays bare, though, are the kinds of costs the country might bear in the meantime. So that could be the long run correction. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, you know, we could have every incentive uh, for politicians, whether you know, uh, this president or others, to continue to exploit the apparently permissible, casual relationship that leaders of our government can have with the truth, um, to make a set of claims, to try and create realities that if they were true would mobilize a sort of right. politics that could sustain them for a period of time. Um, and so again, you're uh, not charged with solving all of this for us as much as for diagnosing the depth of the problem. But one piece of it we haven't talked about is this erosion of respect for some common understanding of facts. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that Senator Moynihan's idea that you can have your own opinion but not your own facts. Well, we've expanded is, the frontiers of human rights. Yeah, and now, now, right. now you can have your own facts. Um, talk about that and, and what, if anything, to do about that. Well, in, in the days where... Um, this is the last question, by the way. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll go to questions from the audience after this. And so if you have questions, I think we're going to take them at the microphone over here. So line up on this side, please. Um, um, truth. OK. Um, social media have enabled many people to have their own relationship with truth. We've all seen that. Um, but I am, am not somebody who believes this is what we're seeing here is mostly a social media phenomenon. Okay. I, I think what we're seeing is, is this. The reason we used to have an agreed upon set of facts was not that in 1972, a lot of people didn't believe <coughs> a lot of crazy things. Because in 1972, a lot of people did believe a lot of crazy things. But what you had in 1972 was a much more cohesive political, social, economic, and financial elite that agreed among themselves on what the facts, as far as they were concerned, were. Um, as the, so the, the breakdown So of not the a broad facts, consensus, but an elite consensus. An elite consensus. About material facts. So people yeah. believed all kinds of things out there. And there were all these newsletters. I used to get them. I was involved in right-wing politics for a long time. They're pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are people who believe that you know, floor, famously, fluoridation of the water was a communist plot. But you didn't get into the president's cabinet if you believe that. <laughs> uh, you didn't become governor of a state if you believe that. Um, you, know, you, you, you didn't have access to television if you believe that. Mm. Um, so people might believe it, but there was an elite consensus, and that was operational. So the reason for the breakdown of this truth, it's not, I don't think it's driven by technology. Technology accelerates it and empowers it. But it's, it's also a product of the radical, the way we play politics more savagely, and the breakdown of elite consensus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. Um, okay, we're going to turn to questions from the audience. Two ground rules. We have a queue here. Um, so I'm speaking to the folks in the queue and others who might join it. Two ground rules. One question per person only. Um, that means no subparts, just one question. Um, and it must actually be a question. Each of you, I bet, has ideas for longer things that could be said, and they're brilliant. We're going to stipulate. But uh, these, these have to be questions, and then we'll get as many answers from David as we can. Please, sir. Yes, my name is Christopher Vicciola. I'm on Congressman Jim Himes campaign. My question is to Mr. Frum, do you feel President Trump has mental health problems? Because that's come up. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert. I hesitate to diagnose. Let me put this, I, I think obviously um, he's got a structure of his brain that's pretty strange. Um, <laughs> uh, he's got, I mean, it's pretty obvious he doesn't have the level of empathy that I would like to see in someone who is a member of my family or married to a member of my family. Um, but I think you have, he's a very wily survivor. His skill, his methods work for him. Um, and so if, if you think of him as somebody who's non-functional, I think you make a mistake. Hmm. So let's say uh, Trump drops out before 2020 or has, devastating losses in the House um, in 2018 and whatnot. What happens to all of the very pro-Trump members of Congress? Do you think, do they stay in power? Do they 
continue yeah. as they were? Well, let's break out those two scenarios. That's okay. That was one question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was really worried. Okay. So let's break those. In. If supposing there are major losses in 2018, um, although remember the economy's strong, mm. uh, wages are rising, and many people outside of the in the red states are paying less tax and like it. Um, uh, so they may not the losses may not be as devastating as, as usually predicted. Let's say they are. My prediction of what happens then is that the remnants of the Republican Party have to cling tighter to Donald Trump. It takes the House, Senate, and President to pass a tax cut, but it takes only the President to defend the tax cut. They become more beholden to him. Um, the, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where, barring some extreme health event, he doesn't seek uh, re-election. Re um, if there is some. But, um, if there is some absolutely conclusive scandal, um, it, it may be uh, that you move your way to some kind of post-Trump Republicanism. But my guess is that the, the scandal, that what Bob Mueller, my own guess, and it's just a guess of what Mueller will reveal, he'll reveal a bunch of things that are illegal, but that involve smaller level people and that, and that um, are not core to what happened in 2016. And the things that he will reveal that are core to what happened in 2016 are likely to be not illegal. And so it will be possible for many people um, to be bound to Donald Trump. I mean, the day may come when there are Republicans who say, that guy, I never heard of him. But that day is, is a ways off. I am a researcher at the Brennan Center. Thank you for speaking here today. Um, it seems like one of the reasons the president has been able to smash these norms and institutions is because the American people don't have a terrible amount of trust in these institutions, You know, people with fancy degrees and fancy office buildings in New York or DC. Um, how do those institutions try to regain the trust of the people so maybe it's not so easy to smash them? Um, that's a great question. I, I think one of the things that we have learned about ourselves that we didn't know was um, the democratic norms and institutions that grew up after the war, um, grew up in the New Deal and Progressive Era, um, they had two selling points. One was they um, respected human dignity and human rights and you know, protected people from the midnight knock on the door. And the second, especially after World War II, was they delivered material goods mm. in a way that had never, to ordinary people, in a way that had never been seen before. And those two things were the, um, people don't separate these things in their mind. They seem the same. What has happened um, beginning in the early 1990s, and especially since the Great Recession, is these systems, not just in this country, are not delivering the goods for ordinary people in the way they used to. And so we are inviting ordinary people to, we're urging them to care about the, the procedural benefits, the dignity part. And what we're discovering is that was only part of the deal and maybe the less powerful part. So if you want to get people excited about liberal democratic norms, liberal democracy has to start delivering the goods in a, a much more spectacular way. Uh, I haven't read the book yet, but I don't imagine there's much in the way of relationship advice in democracy. <laughs> but I was wondering if you had any thoughts. Paperback edition. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how we hold on to each other and our important relationships in these uh, divisive yeah. times. Well, surprisingly, although there's no relationship advice, there is a lot of relationship comment in the book because <laughs> because one of the things, one of the ways that America is coming apart, and I think it's very important what happened in 2016, um, is that men and women are moving apart in, mm -hmm. in this way. Um, mm -hmm. Among people under 30, they are less likely to be married or living with somebody than at any point since record keeping began. And you know, since always older people like me say, well, we know all about that hookup culture. But when you actually look at for some pretty reliable statistics, it turns out they're actually not even sexually involved with one another outside of marriage. Um, and I, I won't take time now to talk about why I think that's so, and maybe I, maybe, and we're just guessing anyway at that point. But the consequences are, are real, which is um, you have, as young men and women come apart, that you have a, a, um, a, poli a very powerful politics of male anger, not just in this country, um, that appeals to men who are living, or young men, who are living apart from women who can't, you know, knock it off, are you kidding? You know, I think that's what a lot of what drives the gun debate. That the gun debate, what the gun offers is male power at a time um, when many men feel they're losing it. And it offers uh, male power in a way that women would once, if they lived in the house with the man, would once have checked. You can't get, you have to get rid of that gun while we have the baby, but now they don't, they live apart. Um, so uh, one of the ways that we are um, 
trouble as a society is that we, um, people are, Americans are forming fewer intimate relationships later in life and holding on to them less well. What if the stakes are even higher than what you're talking about? Oh, and no. we're in, we're in a, <laughs> and your picture is actually rosy. My concern is that given that maybe 25 to 35 percent of our population actually believes deeply and profoundly what Fox and Trump are saying, they believe this stuff, and most of them are well armed. Um, Putin doesn't care about what happens in this country, he wants to bring us down to his level. Trump, I don't see any conscience or decency at all in Trump. He's capable of, of seeing half of us die rather than him losing power. Is there any, I think that you have to consider the possibility and you, your idea of, can we go the way of, uh, of what Milosevic did to, to Yugoslavia? Are our divisions that deep? Can, can we sink to that level? Because prior to Milosevic, everybody thought that place was cool. They were all marrying each other in Belgrade. They had a nice life. And they thought it could never happen there. Can it happen here? Well, and how can we stop it? If it, you know, uh, enough said. Okay. Uh, so here's some good news. Um, <laughs> that, that it really is observably true that modern pol politics is way less violent uh, than it used to be, both between nations and within nations. Um, and modern authoritarians are way less violent than their predecessors were. I mean, Vladimir Putin is probably the most murderous authoritarian leader on the planet. But what he has done over his career, Stalin wouldn't think he'd earned lunch if he did it in a single day. Um, uh, so I think there are many more inhibitions on the use of violence than there used to be. And, um, and um, you know, Milosevic is something of an exception to that rule, but also something of a confirmation of that rule, because the violence, he was there at the infancy of CNN, um, and the, the violence was broadcast, and that there was an international reaction that was way disproportionate to the strategic significance of what was happening in Yugoslavia. Uh, um, and, I think one of the, and I think one of the things that, I mean, as, as horrifying as these school massacres are, and, and as, as much as they seem to be getting worse and feeding on each other, it's also true that every one of them is a national event. And this one, in this recent one, seems to be kind of a miraculous coming together of the nation that we are knowing these people. They're insisting we know them. And, uh, and because of that video from inside the school, that we often draw a kind of veil of obscurity over what it is like to be on the receiving end of such an atrocity. And uh, it, as recently as Columbine, 20 years ago, it was impossible for anyone to see what happened. We read about what happened in the classroom, but we couldn't see it. We're seeing it. And seeing it, you know, and this is maybe goes to the last question. One of the things that maybe at the profoundest level that this whole struggle is about is this. Um, you know, the Romans built the Colosseum about the year 70. It continued operational, I think, into the early 500s. Um, you know, all, all 400 years, I think they had shows twice a week. It was mostly full. Uh, <laughs> watching people hack each other to pieces. Mm -hmm. That there is a deep human appetite for cruelty. Um, it does draw, it fascinates us. St. Augustine said, he used to go to the games in his town, and he, would, uh, and he would pray because he was so fascinated. He found them so tempting and fascinating. One of the founders of the Christian faith. But there's also a part of us that revolts from cruelty, that when we see it, we hate it. And that's what's happening with the video from Florida. And so maybe there's a little test in these days for all of us of which, which of these parts of our nature comes to the fore. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I think one of the reasons, like I ask myself, why have I had such an intense personal reaction um, to the Trump presidency? Because I really, because my wife will testify is here, I mean, it's just, I mean, I can't abide him. Um, so why does I feel, why do I feel so strongly about that? And I think it is having to watch cruelty put on this jumbotron in, mm. in the public, in the center of the mm. world. And, and you have to gaze on it every day and what do you think of it? And you either can stand it or you can't. May common human decency prevail. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Natalie Tennant. I work at the Brennan Center also, and I appreciate your being here. And Dean, thank you. Before I came to the Brennan Center, I was Secretary of State of West Virginia. And the secretaries across the country have now been considered the first responders to democracy. And I think that we saw that a lot, especially this summer with the Presidential Commission on the Integrity for Elections. And so my question is, though, with, with the, the reaction from Trump, 
in 2016. If he doesn't win in 2018 or his party have a majority in 2018, could we see another commission that uh, he wants to form to try yeah. and prove a point? And um, how do we defend that um, again? Right, well, that, that's a fantastic point. I mean, I, I talked a little bit about the commission in the book. It was still a live thing when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. uh, that is an example. One of the Achilles heel of this administration is its slovenliness. Um, and um, the lack of follow through and the chaotic staff, because they could have made much more of a success of that oh, yeah. commission if they'd worked ha harder at it, and um, and they, they may well uh, they may well be be back. Um, and you can also imagine a less extreme version of that coalition making you know greater inroads. Uh, and there is I mean the battle over what is the Pennsylvania redistricting is I think a foretaste of what is to come. Um, I think all of these things are going to be very, very live issues. And um, uh, right now, but here's a way to think about this. Um, I, this is example of the book. So right now, the Republican Party, since 2016, has more power than it did at any time since the 1920s. Um, you know, two houses of Congress. I forget now what percentage of the state, but an enormous advantage in state legislatures. Um, I, you have to go back to the the, the Coolidge era. But when Coolidge was as dominant as the Republicans are now, the Republicans were also dominant in the knowledge centers of the country. In the election of 1924, Coolidge won 55% of the vote in New York, you know, the financial and intellectual center of the country. He won 65% of the vote in Pennsylvania, the industrial center. He won almost 75% of the vote in the, new, in the new economy state of Michigan. Today, although the Republicans are so, any place where a product is invented or a song is written or a TV series or a new idea, they, they are absent. And so you have this disconnect between the creativity of the country and the voting power of the country that I don't think has ever happened before in American life. Um, it, it's as if William Jennings Bryan somehow got hold of all of the instrumentalities of power in 1896. <laughs> and um, you, if you can't hold on to that consensually, you have to hold on to it. You either lose it, which is one outcome, or you find yourself having to de-democratize the state. Um, yeah, thank you again. I really enjoyed the uh, discussion. <clears throat> I just um, I was thinking a little bit about uh, your point about majoritarian politics. I mean, you, you're you both, uh, you know, optimistic about that prospect. And um, I guess I don't the question... I know we're optimistic at all about that prospect. <laughs> okay. <but> no. <laughs> well, optimistic enough, I guess, relative to where I am. Um, but uh, as so, uh, you know, speaking as a moderate, I just I I I, I find t you know the Republican brand as a you know as a result of this presidency um, just tarnished. I mean, I it's very difficult for somebody like me. I'm an immigrant to this country. Um, it's very difficult to extricate the rhetoric, um, sort of the anti-immigrant sentiment from the brand of this party. And I think there were a lot of people like me that potentially could have been in the center of the party or to the center right of the party, perhaps. But there's really no place for us to go anymore. And you know, if this majoritarian impulse is where we're headed, we have a more diverse electorate, um, but we have a center, uh, you know, a good 35% of the country maybe is even uh, considers itself independent. Um, and so can we really continue to, to keep this party the way that it is? I mean, do we need to start a new party? Well, let, let me offer, um, that's a very pessimistic statement. Let me offer some basis for hope, because I, I end the book that way. Um, and it's not tacked on like those 14-point plans. It's really organic to the yeah. argument of the book. So here, here are some things I, I see that have really inspired me that have been some, I call, I call them the gifts of Trump, things he's giving us. Um, the first is that he's ha helped us to see the country better and its problems. You know, that I mentioned before we have we have these incredible coastal knowledge centers where, where the recovery from the Great Recession is complete, um, where new progress is being made, where all these amazing products are being invented, and the idea that we are we are living through the greatest substance abuse addiction since before prohibition, 
um, that more Americans are dying of drugs and died in Vietnam in a shorter period of time. That's something we didn't see. I mean, you go, I, I have a section in the book about um, you know, how invisible it was if you look at the indexes of newspapers in the year 2016. Mm. Um, and suddenly we see it. We see what is happening to people who are your countrymen. Um, I think we have, you've talked a lot in your questions about truth. You know, the phrase post-truth began not as a criticism, but as a compliment. And it began in universities like this one, where the claim was that truth was overbearing, it was uh, out of date, it was, uh, Michel Foucault suggested it was literally totalitarian, and the, the, his disciples said, we need a post-truth, we need to replace the tyranny of truth with the freedom of truths. And what Donald Trump has shown is the opposite of truth is not truths, the opposite of truth is lying. And, <laughs> and democracy can't bear it, because in a democracy we all make decisions for ourselves, and we, uh, in a, if we live in a tiny aristocracy, you know, word of mouth would tell us what was going on, but the sovereign power is vested in people who rely on mass media to know how to cast their vote intelligently. Truth is indispensable, and that is something. And suddenly you see people in places like this talking about truth in a way that I think you would have found professionally embarrassing 24 months ago. Um, uh, you see uh, a, a sudden awakening. This is, for, this is gratifying to those of us on the right-hand side of the spectrum. You know, uh, if four years ago, if I were in a hall like this, and I said, Edward Snowden is not a hero, uh, I don't know how receptive an audience I would have found. But I think one of the things that we have all been forced to confront is danger in the modern age comes not only from tanks and rockets, but it's in the form of clandestine cyber attacks. And the people who stand on guard against that at the National Security Agency and the FBI and, yes, the CIA, are every bit as integral to America's defense as the uh, Army, Navy, and Coast Guard. Um, and the people who take it on themselves to subvert those institutions are attacking the security of the country. Um, I think, you know, to your point about um, about the relation between groups. I mean, I think one that at a different time, the Me Too debate could have been just as explosive as it is, but I don't think it would have been seen as central. Um, it would have been seen as another issue in politics, along with the deficit and you know what are we going to do about North Korea. I think that the Trump um, experience has forced people to confront how people are treated in daily life is absolutely integral to the political structure of your country because you've seen you know, that, um, and it's not just incidental to who he is that Donald Trump is an abuser of women. It is absolutely crucial to who he is. And that uh, contempt for women was not just an incidental theme of the 2016 election, it was central. And it was central, by the way, to some of the Democratic primaries as well as the general election. The, the uh, gender gap between Sanders and Clinton in the Democratic primary was bigger than the gender gap in the general election. Yeah. Um, so I, I think um, you know, it may be that we will look back on this and see this is a period of uh, American renewal and self-discovery and commitment to higher ideas and to better standards. And if that happens, we may end up, you know, that it may be that we will owe him a perverse debt of thanks. <laughs> wow. Uh, with apologies to the Okay, that was a long answer. The, I'm sorry. That was a long answer. Um, I, I'm getting the sign that we're we're reaching time. Um, that is uh, an amazing note upon which to end. But let me just let me just pose one last question, and allow you to close an answer to this, David. I thought what you said about um, about cruelty being a defining characteristic of the public face of this administration was really, for me, very very meaningful and moving. Um, and I think it's right. It really resonates. And that's a cost that we're all bearing. On the other hand, there at least have been moments in the last year where it seemed like the pace of outrage has been so fast um, that episodes, events, actions, words, deeds um, that deserved an entire year of outrage and debate and discussion about what to do are just eclipsed a couple of days later by the next. And Somewhere in the midst of that, there's a risk that we're, we're just becoming calloused to this, yeah. that we're normalizing it. Um, so how do we, uh, if we pre-commit ourselves to not allowing the normalization to happen, uh, how, do we, how do we help ensure that we can do it? That? It's hard. I mean, it, is, um, it is hard not, to, things that happen every day become normal. I mean, you can say don't normalize this, but they do become normal. Uh, people, who are li who, people who live through the blitz found the blitz became normal. Hmm. Um, and 
this is, this is our normality. Uh, this is the way we live now. Um, and, so, and at some level, you, you can't let it make you crazy. Um, and you also have to avoid um, reacting to every little thing because it, you will become literally crazy. Uh, so um, I, I try, one of the things that the book did, I think one of the values of doing it at the end of year one, if I'd done it at the end of year eight, I just, by editing, I would have had to leave out a lot of things. It's a little <laughs> bit of a diary of things that have happened. Uh, you know, un unlike Michael Wolff, I can't promise you any sensational revelations, but it will feel like sensational revelations because you have forgotten 80% of it already. <laughs> this is true. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the way you cope with it ultimately is by rising, is not, by not trying to master all of the detail, because that's impossible, but by rising above it to seeing the great themes of the specific areas of wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and those great themes of wrong do reduce themselves to a manageable number that you can keep track of. And then each atrocity becomes another for instance of that. The book is Trumpocracy. Please join me in thanking David Trump. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.